So for more than 100 years, since the first glimpses of the red planet through large refractor telescopes and the mistaken impression of canals on its surface, Mars has fascinated humankind with the prospect of harboring life. Let's jump ahead, however, 100 years to right now, to present day, and Jupiter's moon Europa beckons with even more compelling evidence that life might exist in the ocean depths below its icy crust. So good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the third installment of our now virtual SETI Talks lecture series. This is the monthly lecture series produced by the SETI Institute in Mountain View, California. I'm Bill Diamond, President and CEO of the Institute. We are a 501c3 nonprofit research and education institution whose mission is to seek out life beyond Earth and understand and explain its nature, origins, and evolution. Like people the world over, we're currently doing this work from home, but our research, education, and outreach programs continue unabated. COVID-19 has forced us all to rethink how we live and work and function under truly unprecedented and extraordinary constraints. Tonight's virtual presentation is just one example of how all kinds of organizations are leveraging already familiar tools and technologies to overcome these constraints and stay mission focused. The SETI Talk series is usually presented live at SRI International in Menlo Park, California. Each lecture or panel discussion is video recorded and they live on through our SETI Institute YouTube channel, where you can find over 400 presentations and interviews and panel discussions covering an extraordinary array of space science topics. So we invite you to take a look at our YouTube channel and, and uh, just do a search and have some fun and, and take a journey uh, in space science and exploration with the SETI Institute. In our live presentations, we like to poll the audience to find out how many are attending a talk for the very first time. So we're continuing that tradition in this virtual environment and ask you to let us know if this is your first SETI Talks experience. You will see on the uh, screen a poll that will give you the opportunity to answer and let us if uh, yes, you've attended before, or yes, you've only done so, but online, or no, you haven't. So let us know and then we'll share the, um, the poll results with you later on. It's always kind of fun to see who we're reaching. Um, so tonight we're taking you on a journey to Europa. SETI Institute Astronomer and Director of Education and Public Outreach, Dr. Simon Steele will lead a fascinating discussion with two subject matter experts on Jupiter's most tantalizing moon. Before turning over the podium to Simon, however, I'd like to pause briefly here to say something about a very special event taking place later this month. We're all familiar with May as the month of graduations and late spring weddings of Memorial Day and the prelude to summer, but this year May also marks a very special anniversary, and that is the 90th birthday of our own Frank Drake, SETI pioneer, emeritus trustee of the SETI Institute, member of the SETI Institute Science Advisory Board. We actually had a meeting today and Frank was there, and creator of the now famous Drake Equation. If you've never heard of it, you probably don't belong here, but we will give you a chance. If you've never heard of it, Google it, look it up. It's the Drake Equation. And next Thursday, May 28th, is Frank's 90th birthday. So it would be really fun, would be really great, would be to hear from you and to have birthday greetings coming in from all over planet Earth uh, to wish Frank happy birthday. So if you'd like to send a message, uh, send us an email, uh, and the email address you want to use is info at SETI.org, info at SETI.org, and say happy birthday. I, it would be fun uh, for Frank to see greetings from all over the place. He doesn't know I'm doing this tonight, so that would make it even more fun. But now, without further ado, let me turn the microphone over to Simon, who will introduce tonight's panelists and will moderate the conversation. Simon? Okay. Great. Thanks, Bill, and, and good evening, everybody uh, from all over the world, probably listening in tonight. Um, so what if alien life were thriving in an ocean beneath the icy surface of Jupiter's moon Europa? Uh, recent observations of Europa from Earth-based telescopes and reanalysis of spacecraft data have increased the confidence for the existence of Europa's ocean. The possibility of a thin plume of water in 2019 being ejected from Europa's surface has re-energized the community, which is now looking for a new way to answer these questions. Could a spacecraft travel through one of these plumes, sample and analyze it, and confirm the existence of life in the hidden ocean? What kind of biomarker should we be looking for? Ultimately, could we actually uh, land a probe on 
the icy crust and explore the ocean, just as we explore the oceans of Earth. So these are, these are all questions. Um, and in a moment, I'm going to introduce uh, tonight's guests who are seeking to answer these and more. Um, and when the speakers have presented their work, we're gonna have a little bit of a discussion. And then we're gonna open the floor to questions from you, the audience. And what we would like you to do is to post these questions in the Q&A box of Zoom. And our two um, uh, moderators, from Machis and Rebecca McDonald, will be uh, fielding those questions to the panelists. So that's something to do at any time. Please uh, pop those questions into the Q&A box. Okay, I'm just gonna introduce the two speakers and then we'll listen to their presentations. Um, the first speaker is gonna be Dr. Cynthia Phillips. Uh, she is a planetary geologist at the NASA Jet Propulsion Laboratory in Pasadena, California. She's a project staff scientist and science communications lead for the upcoming Europa Clipper mission and also works on a variety of future mission concepts to land on the surface and explore the subsurface of Europa and other ocean worlds. Her scientific research has involved small scale surface processes and surface subsurface exchanges on icy surfaces, that's a lot of surfaces, uh, as well as interests in scientific image processing, remote sensing, impact craters, surface geology and geophysics. Uh, Dr. Phillips received an AB in astronomy and astrophysics and physics from Harvard University. PhD in planetary science with a minor in geoscience from the University of Arizona. And she spent 15 years as a research scientist here at the SETI Institute before joining JPL. I'm gonna introduce as well, Dr. Um, Jill Makuki. Uh, she is a polar microbial ecologist who studies ice covered Antarctic ecosystems. She is an associate professor of microbiology at the University of Tennessee, Knoxville and her research interests include extremophiles and astrobiology. Um, Dr. Mikuki has served as a member of the NSF Science Advisory Board to the US Ice Drilling Program Office and chair of its subglacial access working group. Uh, she received a PhD in Antarctic Microbial Ecology from Montana State University and has remained interested in the structure and function of microbial ecosystems below the ice ever since. Jill has participated in numerous Antarctic field projects, including investigations at Blood Falls, maybe we'll hear more about that, um, and the first sampling of an Antarctic subglacial lake, Lake Williams, which obviously is very relevant to the topic tonight. So welcome, Cynthia and Jill, lovely to speak to you. Um, I'm gonna invite both of you to speak for around four minutes and then, then we can have some discussion. So uh, Cynthia, uh, over to you to start the conversation. Excellent. Uh, thanks, Simon, and hello, everyone. Um, let me share a picture with you. So here's Europa. Now you can see it. You can see how gorgeous it is. So this is the world that, again, it's, it's about the same size as Earth's moon, but now that you can see it, you can see how different it looks. The surface is covered with a bright, smooth regions that are made up of mostly of water ice and then there's darker areas that we think are made up of non-ice materials that have been mixed in with that ice on the surface. Um, we can see cracks, we can see ridges, we can see places where that icy surface has been broken up and we think that Europa is one of the best places beyond the earth to look for life and this is because we think that it has the planetary ingredients for life. And when I say life, this is really life as we know it. So we think that life that we find here on the earth, it needs liquid water, it needs the right series of essential chemical elements. Those are things like carbon, hydrogen, nitrogen, phosphorus, sulfur, oxygen. Um, it needs some kind of energy source, so chemical energy so that it can sustain reactions that can help life to grow and thrive and reproduce and change over time. Um, and then finally, we think that life needs stability. We think that for life to form and evolve and change, um, you need to have a stable environment. You need to have a place where there's enough time for these reactions to take place. And we think that Europa meets all of these requirements. Um, in fact, we think that Europa is one of the best places in our solar system to look for life beyond the Earth. Um, a lot of people like Mars and, you know, Mars is great, but Europa has an ocean that we're pretty sure is there today that has more water than all of Earth's oceans combined. 
And here's what Europa might look like below its surface. So this is an artist's conception here that shows what's going on at the very surface of Europa, where we have regions, we have cracks, we have places where maybe material from that liquid ocean is moving up through the ice shell um, and could make its way to the surface. Um, this isn't a crazy idea. We've actually seen plumes of material being ejected from the surface of a tiny moon of Saturn called Enceladus. And so it's possible that such plumes could also be, ex be existing on Europa, although we haven't found any really definitive evidence of those plumes yet. Um, so on Europa, there's a couple of really interesting places to look for life. So there's the surface, of course, but one of the problems with the surface of Europa is that it's not like the surface of the Earth. There is no atmosphere, and the surface is bathed in, in punishing radiation. So you can see the charged particles in this image. That's material that's accelerated by Jupiter's strong magnetic field, um, and it irradiates the surface. So if any life was exposed to the vacuum at temperatures well below zero, we're talking temperatures of about 100 Kelvin on the surface, um, and to this punishing radiation, if any life did make it up there, you know, those fish aren't going to live for very long. And we don't actually think there's fish on Europe, unfortunately. Um, but if you go down below the surface, um, as you move further down, it turns out that ice is a very good shield. It could help to protect the subsurface from some of that radiation. And it's possible that inside those ice layers, there could be pockets of liquid water. You can see there's some ice fractures and veins maybe in this ice layer. We don't know how thick that ice layer is. We think that it's at least 10 kilometers, maybe thicker. So maybe more like 20 or 30. Maybe there's places where it's thinner. Um, we know from measurements that have been taken by a previous spacecraft to visit Europa that the whole layer at the surface that includes the ice and the water is about 100 kilometers or so. So below this ice layer is this liquid water ocean. And so if we're thinking about places where life might want to be, the, the cracks and fissures and maybe melt lenses or kind of lake-like inclusions in the ice layer are a good place to look. Another good place to look is at the bottom of the ice layer. So where the ice touches that ocean layer, that could be another good place where life might like to be. But a really intriguing place um, also is at the bottom of the ocean, where the ocean touches the rocky interior of Europa. And there, it's possible that we could have hydrothermal events like we see at the bottom of Earth's oceans. And as we know from studies of the deep oceans of Earth, we know that there's, there are amazing ecosystems at the bottom of Earth's oceans. And so it's possible that life could survive and thrive deep down at the bottom of Europa's ocean. And so all of these are very interesting places where we could look for life. But again, I'm a geophysicist. I'm a you know, planetary geologist. I don't study life. And so that's why I'm so excited to get to chat today with uh, Jill, who's an actual card-carrying biologist. So I'll turn it back over to you, Simon. Okay, wonderful. Thank, thank you very much indeed. Um, just before Jill starts, um, and not to intimidate everyone, uh, we now have 441 people on online. Welcome everybody from Florida, Chile, uh, Christchurch, New Zealand, Santa Fe, uh, India, and Lima, Peru. So welcome everybody from around the world. Um, and I'm going to hand it over to Jill to, to, to take up the, the, the biology flag for this, this evening's uh, talks. All right. Well, um, thank you so much. I'd like to thank um, SETI for organizing and inviting me. And I'd like to thank you all for um, tuning in from all over the place to um, talk about one of my favorite topics. Now I'm going to try to share my screen with y'all. All right. Are, they, are we there? It, yep. Good. Okay, sounds great. Um, so tonight I'm psyched to talk about one of my favorite places, and this is Antarctica. And it may be one of the closest um, analogs we can get to on Earth that are like the ocean worlds that Cynthia just described. And as you can see from looking at it, it is just a big continent of white. It is about the size of US and Mexico combined and it houses 90% of the Earth's ice, and it's been called a big dead place, and you can see from these images why um, that might be the case. It's also one of the places where the coldest recorded temperatures on Earth are. Um, it doesn't get to Europa surface temperatures, but it does get down to about minus 89 degrees C, it was recorded once at Vostok Station, and that's about a minus 128 degrees Fahrenheit. 
And so um, what this looks like to me though is a microbial ecosystem. I know folks usually think of penguins and seals, but if you can get into and below the ice, it's a really great place to study cold loving microorganisms and pretend you're on an ocean world um, like Europa. So how do you go from this um, uh, space view of Antarctica and find where you might find microbial life? Um, and so I'm gonna take you to a place right here in East Antarctica. It's along the edge, it's called the McMurdo Dry Valleys. And to look for life in a place like this, you would first have to look for where the water might be. And so you'd come in from an aerial view and look at it from uh, some form of remote sensing you will try to get a little bit closer and take some high resolution images and see if you can find a potential spot that looks intriguing. And so here's a picture of uh, Taylor Glacier and this is an, actually a very intriguing place. And then once you find a great place that you may want to sample, maybe you can go there with some fancy instrument. This is actually a picture of a thermal melting probe um, called the ice mole that can navigate through ice to collect samples. Unlike Europa, I can walk up to some of these features and actually collect samples by hand. Um, and so here in my purple gloved hand is a sample of subglacial liquid. Um, and then if you're lucky enough to get a sample, then you can look for life. These little squiggles and dots are what I get excited about. These are actually microorganisms. And then if you can bring a sample home and back to your laboratory, you can take some uh, really fancy high resolution electron uh, microscope images and get to really get to know these microbes with their um, cool appendages like flagella. So the challenge here really is a challenge of scale, right? So some of these remote sensed images are taken at a kilometer, but a microbe lives at a micrometer. And to just put that into perspective for you, I'm here in Knoxville, Tennessee, and the SETI Institute is out in Mountain View, California, and that's over 2,000 miles. And looking at that span of distance for something about the size of my pen tip is what it's like to look at that level of scale for a microorganism. But it's doable, right? When you um, sense remotely, you can potentially find um, little squiggles that actually are inference about where liquid might be. You can see whether there's salts there, maybe there's a brine. You can look at maybe rock permittive uh, porosity and potentially see changes in chemistry um, from some of the remote instruments that are used by NASA. And so maybe you can identify a place where there's good liquid, like Cynthia was talking about with the subsurface ocean. And that to me um, spells out habitat. And so these could be um, potentially cool places. Um, once you get closer in and you find a cool place to sample, um, maybe you can look to see if there's anything accessible from the surface. And so these would be some of the plumes that might be coming out on Europa. Uh, in Antarctica, this is places where subsurface liquid might leap out to the surface and be more accessible for us to sample. Even though the ice on Antarctica is not as thick as Europa, it still can be hundreds of meters, if not kilometers in places. And so it's still a technical challenge to collect these samples. Um, so if you can find a place at the surface, maybe aerial image will um, reveal this. And last, if you can be lucky enough to get one of those samples, this is where you can potentially detect signs of life. And some of those signs of life may be a little bit more ambiguous to determine what they're coming from, right? So like biosignatures of those essential chemicals that life needs. But maybe you can see other clues such as minerals that are precipitated in such a way that they're only made by uh, biology, right? And so this is an image here of a microbially um, produced calcite crystal. Maybe you'll also find features that show evidence of life rearranging its environment around it, like the base of sea ice. This is an image here of algal um, blooms that are growing at the base of sea ice here in Antarctica, um, possibly something we might see on Europa. And if you're lucky enough to get some type of information biomolecule, right, like on Earth DNA, then you can really um, start to elucidate a lot of fascinating information about the lifestyles of these organisms. Wonderful. Thank you very much. And, and of course, what we're interested in here is the, the interface between both of, both of your researchers. Um, and it's a shame at the moment, Jill, we can't actually transport you to, to the, well, maybe you're probably happy that we can't transport you to the surface of Europa, but uh, uh, be interesting to hear what you think you would see if you were there. Um, 
So Cynthia, just a quick question uh, uh, about Europa, of course. We all hear about um, the, uh, uh, the zone, the habitable zone around a star uh, where there is liquid water. Now, now this moon of Jupiter, this is five times further away from the sun than, than the Earth is. That's a long way outside the habitable zone. And so what is going on with this, this, this moon with an ocean? And, and how do we know for sure that there's an ocean underneath all that ice? Yeah, that, that's a great question, Simon. Um, so, so yeah, we, when we first started thinking about the habitable zone, like you said, that, that was defined as the, the distance around a sun where liquid water could be stable at the surface of a planet. And that seems to make sense because then we look at our solar system and we're like, okay, Venus is too close to the sun, it's too hot. Liquid can't be stable there. Mars is a little bit too far away, it's too cold, but you know, here we are in the Hadwell zone, you know, the Goldilocks zone where Earth is just right. And that's a story that works in this very sort of simplified, simplistic view of our solar system. But as we've studied our own solar system more, and also as we've started looking at extrasolar planets, so other solar systems that are around other stars, we started to see that there's a huge diversity of solar systems out there. And there's potentially a huge diversity of worlds that could be habitable. And so what's going on with Europa? So again, it's this little tiny moon and it's, yeah, it's, it's far away from the sun. So the sun just looks like a really bright star in the sky. Um, so the surface is cold, there's no atmosphere, but what Europa has going for it is something called tidal heating. So there's this elegant dance where three of the large regular satellites of Jupiter, there's Io, there's Europa, and there's Ganymede. So every time Ganymede goes around Jupiter once, Europa goes around twice, and Io goes around four times. This creates what's called a resonance, where the satellites line up at the same place in their orbit each time, and they tug on each other. And those tugs, those gravitational pulls, mean that the orbits stay slightly non-circular. Um, and that's important because generally, if you just had one moon, if it was orbiting Jupiter, the orbit would turn circular over time. All of the kind of the bumps and wiggles and dis differences in distance would even out and you would just get a nice, perfect circular orbit. But because of this resonance, the distance from, say, Europa to Jupiter varies. Sometimes it's closer and sometimes it's further away. That matters because of tides. So Jupiter is the most massive object in our solar system, and Jupiter's gravity pulls on Europa's surface. When Europa is a little bit closer to Jupiter, the surface gets tugged on, it gets stretched. And then when it's a little further away, the surface goes back down. So if you were standing at a point on Europa's surface, it would be like the ground would go up and down, um, maybe as much as 30 meters over the course of this tidal cycle. And so tides happen on the Earth. That's what happens when the moon's gravity tugs on the Earth. And that's what makes the oceans move and slosh back and forth. That same process happens on Europa, but there's so much more force that we think that that produces tidal heating. And that heating takes place, we think, deep in the ice layer of Europa, and it squishes and pulls and just that frictional motion creates heat. And so there's enough tidal heating that it could keep Europa's ocean liquid over the whole age of the solar system. We think this resonance has been there since, you know, for the last 4 billion years. So since very soon after Europa and Ganymede and Io and Jupiter formed, we think this resonance is very old. And so we think that it's that heating that's created this ocean that could have been there for 4 billion years. Wow. So it's being stretched and squeezed and that like a rubber ball. And if you do that enough and there's an experiment you can do at home, you, you yep. would actually feel that ball heating up and that that's Jupiter stretching and squeezing with the moons that, that, so, you know, we needn't limit ourselves to the habitable zone when we look at exoplanets and look for, for ocean life. That's, that's quite amazing. Jill, t tell us a little bit more about uh, a day in the life in Antarctica and and of course, you're, you're you know, looking for, for biomarkers, things that indicate that, that life is present or maybe was present, um, not necessarily the, for the little, little uh, fish or bugs themselves. Um, tell us how you go about uh, uh, planning that, that expedition and, and what you're looking for. Yeah, so I mean, it's one of those things where you have to go in with an open mind. Uh, you're not gonna see trees or, or fish or other things uh, lying around, you're going to just see what looks like barren rock or ice. And so it's really challenging 
to find the microbial life within that. And so the, the, I guess the process first starts when you imagine where you want to go to look for life. And so it's really a strong collaboration, right? You have to work with uh, geophysicists and glaciologists and other um, scientists so you can collaborate and think about where these pockets for life might be. Much like uh, Cynthia was talking about how it was a surprise to find these oceans on Europa. For a long time, we didn't think there was these large lakes below um, the ice sheet of Antarctica. But um, when scientists used modern tools and looked back uh, over old radar data, they found hundreds of lakes below the ice. And so when a microbial ecologist hears that kind of story, then I think that's where I want to go. And so that's then where the logistical package starts to come together where you think, okay, uh, what do we need to get through the ice? Well, I guess we need a drill of some kind. And so then you have to reach out to engineers and work with them to help you design tools to collect your samples. And then you start thinking about your basic human needs, like how do we get there? What kind of protective clothing do we need? What kind of sample gears? So in the one sense, you're, you're trying to think about all the things you need for your science, but then you're also trying to think about all the things you need um, as a human to be operating down there and, and living and sampling. Yeah, because you know, you're complaining about Antarctica, you know, it's, it's cold and you know, wet and everything, but this of course is nothing compared to, to Europa. Right? It, it's uh, the extremes of, of, of what's on the surface of Europa are, are, are quite phenomenal, aren't they, uh, Cynthia? Um, tell, us, tell us what it would be like for an expedition there. Um, an expedition to the surface of Europa would be uh, very short-lived unless you brought a whole bunch of protective gear. Um, basically, the, the, so there's, there's no atmosphere, so you'd need like a serious vacuum spacesuit. Um, it's really, really cold, so you'd have to stay warm. But even beyond that, you'd have to deal with that radiation. The radiation is just punishing. Um, if you were just in a standard kind of NASA issue moon type of spacesuit, you could probably only survive on the surface for, you know, maybe tens of minutes before you got a lethal dose of radiation. So the surface of Europa really is not going to be a good place to build your next, you know, resort. Um, but I, you know, and I think that one of the good things about Europa is that ice is a pretty good insulator. And so if you can get down below that ice somewhat, then um, the radiation is really a lot better. And so I think that, you know, eventually when we go and build our, our, our field camps and our, you know, luxury hotels in Europa, they're going to be buried beneath the ice. And maybe you have some nice, like, radiation-proof domes or something so you can see Jupiter in the horizon. But you're probably not going to be walking around the surface too much. Um, and that's actually a concern. So we're, we're thinking about a, a future mission called Europa Lander that would actually land on the surface of Europa um, and t dig a little bit below the surface and take some samples and bring them on board for study. And the radiation environment is certainly one of the constraints that we're dealing with. Um, even a radiation hardened spacecraft where you put most of the instrumentation inside of a shielded vault to help protect all of your electronics, um, even something like that can probably only survive for, you know, a month or two on the surface before it gets totally fried. Wow, yeah. And I didn't mean to, to say that Antarctica wasn't a difficult place. <laughs> That's terrible. That came out so wrong. <laughs> no, uh, no, it's fine. And I, I don't complain about the cold. <laughs> <on> the <desert. laughs> uh, so, Jill, if you were, you know, and we'll come back in a moment, Cynthia, to talk about the Europa Clipper mission. Um, what sort of things, Jill, are, are you looking for as, as a biologist, as somebody who, who studies biomarkers and, you know, um, the effects that, that life has on an environment? Uh, what sort of things would you be looking for um, uh, in a mission to, to Europa, either sort of look, getting close to the surface? Obviously, you'd like to land something, and maybe we can talk about that later. But, but uh, what, what sort of biomarkers, what sort of things are you thinking you're looking for um, on the surface? Uh, oh, on the surface, I was just going to say what um, Cynthia was saying about um, human landers. It's the mm. same thing that I would expect for microbial life, right? Like below an ice sheet is actually a pretty comfortable place to be. And you have a lot of potential for nutrients and energy um, sources coming from, for example, these hydrothermal vents. But if I was only able to access the surface, given all of the logistical constraints, 
I would look for uh, places. Oops, sorry, there's a the poll came up. Um, I would, I would, I would look for places of differences, right? Like edges. So um, Cynthia pointed out some of those. Um, what look to be salt rich stripes on the surface, right? So maybe these are places where parts of the subsurface ocean have come to the surface. And in there, potentially some biomarkers can survive. We see this in Antarctica. Granted, it's not as harsh on the surface, but we do see evidence of subsurface life eke out onto the surface, either through metabolic substrates, so um, things that microorganisms have breathed out, like we breathe out CO2, microbes breathe out all sorts of um, metabolites, not just um, energy metabolites like methane or CO2, but other volatiles that uh, talk about their lifestyle in a, in a chemical form. And then maybe also some of these mi mineral precipitates, maybe the salt crystals are shaped differently because you have, they have interacted with life in some way. Mm -hmm. Okay. Because of course, until we can get drilled down, as you say, we, we need to have stuff hopefully rising to the surface and, and leaving some sort of deposit on the surface that gives us, gives us a hint that something might be down there. Yeah. Yeah. It's still probably beneficial to get a little bit below the surface though, if you, if you possibly can. Yeah. Yeah. Cynthia, tell us about um, uh, Europa Clipper and you know some of the design constraints that that has, considering the the harsh environment, um, because that's that's set a, a a limitation, isn't it, on on how close and how long you can stay around Europa? Yeah, absolutely. Um, and so, if you were on Europa, I'd put up my uh, my my fun backdrop that has some dinosaurs in a radiation hardened spacesuit. So you certainly would need some of those if you were going to be on the surface. Yeah. But um, so Europa Clipper is a great mission that we're working on at JPL um, that's going to launch um, sometime in in the the middle of this decade. And um, when you think of a mission that's going to map something from orbit. Um, you usually think about missions to uh, to places like Mars, where you can just go into a nice stable mapping orbit, um, and you're able to you're you're able to just look at the surface um, from a nice consistent view. And missions like that are great to places like Mars, but for somewhere like Europa, unfortunately, if you were in orbit around Europa, you'd be subject to that same punishing radiation. Um, and so, a mission like that could you know maybe survive a month in orbit. And that's just not enough. And so fortunately, um, Europa Clipper, it's a mission that's going to have multiple close flybys of Europa, but it's actually going to be in orbit around Jupiter. And so this was a really clever strategy that the, that the mission planning folks at JPL came up with, where basically you, you go by Jupiter, so you, you, you circle around Jupiter, you go in for a close flyby of Europa. Um, and as you go in, you're kind of going into that radiation hot zone. It's sort of like you hold your breath, you get as close as you can to Europa, you turn on all your instruments, you go flying fast at pretty fast, uh, you take all of your close approach observations, and then you get out of there, you go back into this orbit, back around the other side of Jupiter. It's kind of like you take deep breath, <laughs> you know, you've been underwater, you finally get to breathe again, and then you have some time, a matter of, you know, days or so, um, you know, maybe as much as two weeks to um, finish taking obs your observations, to process them on board the spacecraft, to downlink them back to Earth, to uplink the new plans for the next orbit, um, and then you go in again for another flyby. Mm -hmm. So what Europa Clipper would be able to do is have um, about 45 or 50 close flybys of Europa um, over a couple of years in the Jupiter system. Um, and so that means that we can map um, a very large percentage of the surface um, at very good resolution. Um, and we can, we can do things that we just wouldn't have been able to do in a shorter lifetime mission that was actually in orbit around Europa. Okay. What sort of resolution I'm thinking you know, what, if, if, for instance, you had, you wrote, you had Europa Clipper doing the same thing over Antarctica, I'm wondering if, if the resolution you're getting um, for Europa would be enough for Jill to actually recognize some of the features she's seeing in Antarctica. Mm, that, that would be fabulous, but so the, the highest resolution data that we're going to get from Europa Clipper, it's probably going to be about like half a meter per pixel or so. Um, it depends on the, the actual altitude of the close approach flybys. Um, and so, you know, that's, that's pretty amazing compared to uh, the highest resolution images that we got from the previous spacecraft, from the Galileo spacecraft. Um, that's the only 
close high resolution data that we have for Europa so far. Um, and the highest resolution there was about six to 12 meters per pixel. And we only have a very small handful of images at that resolution from Galileo. So we're, we're certainly gonna be much better with Europa Clipper and we're really looking forward to that, that what is high resolution data to us. But for someone like Jill who can actually go and walk around in her field site, um, I'm sure that that would be, you know, dramatically insufficient to, to see these actual surface features. But that's where the ties between what we see with the remote sensing data and then what we actually see from say aerial imaging. So, so like, like those pictures that Jill was showing at the beginning where you start zooming in from the orbital data into the closer and closer data until you finally get to the ground. That's where those links are so important is that we need to understand we have our remote sensing data, we have our orbital data or our, our flyby data. We need to understand what that's actually going to look like and mean when we get down to the surface. And, and if I could just jump in, I would say that some of the instruments on the Europa Clipper are really exciting because there's like the ice penetrating radar, for example. And so it could potentially reveal, like I showed in that first image, pockets of um, dynamic ice within the ice cover, as well as maybe thinner spots within the ice. And so these are all things that while it might not be that that high resolution picture of a crack in the ice that we really want, it's going to show um, potential habitats and start to really focus you in and show some um, potential edges. And that's where we tend to find life when there's edges involved. So yeah. That's nice. And as you say, if you've got radar and you detect me, you know, we're saying 10 kilometers thick for this ice, maybe there are regions where it's much thinner and that will be a potential uh, landing opportunity. Possibly, yeah. So asking both of you about these plumes, um, we, we know, I've seen much more detail of the plumes on Enceladus because uh, that, that, that was uh, from the Cassini mission. Um, Tell us a little bit about the plumes on, on, on Europa, Cynthia, and then Jill, what sort of things would, if you could pick up material from that plume, what sort of things would you be interested in seeing in that material? So it would be really cool if there were active plumes or geysers that were ejecting material from Europa's surface into space. Um, we haven't we haven't seen any definitive evidence yet that that I would say makes me believe that plumes exist. Um, we've seen a lot of sort of intriguing hints, um, mostly through ground-based or, you know, Earth-based observations, um, either taken by ground-based telescopes or from Hubble Space Telescope, um, as well as reanalysis of data from back when the Galileo spacecraft was in the Jupiter system. And, you know, it we it, there's been some sort of single or maybe multiple data point detections, but we're really at the limit of what we can do with, with terrestrial data sets. Um, and so the discovery of plumes on Enceladus means that plumes on Europa, it's not crazy talk, right? It certainly is plausible that plumes could exist. Um, one thing to note is that the surface of Europa, uh, that the gravity of Europa is much higher than Enceladus, just because Europa is a lot bigger. And so while on Enceladus, you can have plumes that are, you know, they go, you know, more than the radius of the satellite. So they're really, they're, once you know where to look, they're pretty easy to spot. On Europa, they would be much smaller. So they're going to be a lot harder to find than they were on Enceladus. Um, and even the Enceladus ones were very tricky until we knew how to find them. Um, so, so yeah, so I would say that plumes on Europa are an intriguing possibility. It hasn't been proven yet, but Europa Clipper is absolutely going to look for them. Um, and one of the cool things about Europa Clipper is that if plumes do exist, we'll actually be able to fly through them and sample them with some of our onboard instruments that will be able to measure the, the composition of the dust and the gas that's thrown out of the surface. Um, and those instruments will work even if there is no plumes at all, because small concentrations of particles are just naturally thrown off the surface from that radiation. Mm -hmm. Wow. So, um, yeah, carry on, Jill. Well, tell us about oh, what we yeah, just, I'll, just real quick, I'll say what I would be interested in seeing yeah. um, is one, you know, the reality is the plumes will experience a lot of, um, any of the material in them will experience a lot of change from radiation, et cetera, being like violently potentially ejected into the surface, but it still could tell us composition of what source those plumes, right? So maybe learn more about the composition of the ocean, reveal if there's been rock water interactions, which means the water has moved through the, 
the sediments at the bottom of the ocean and circulated through the ocean that could tell us about potential energy sources for microbes. And if there's any compounds that have some type of isotopic fractionation, it could reveal um, elements of selective feeding where life selects certain molecules. So there is a lot of potential in the absence of being able to drill through that thick ice cover to learn about what that ecosystem might be like. Mm -hmm. I'm just interested, Jill, you know, I, this, at first, this is a silly question. Is there a region on, on the surface of the Earth that mimics quite closely uh, the surface of Europa? And of course, it would be Antarctica or maybe the Arctic. Is, is there somewhere that you see the same sort of patterns and flows in Antarctica? Um, uh, could, I, I think it's, it's hard to find a perfect analog. So you have to piece things together, right? Earth is so different. Um, but that's one of the reasons why I'm fascinated with Blood Falls because it's subsurface um, marine water that slowly leaks to the surface and leaves a pattern on ice. And so we can look at how subsurface minerals and microbes interact with an ice surface. And then there's these fumarole features like you might see um, on Mount Meager in Canada or on some of our other Cascade glaciers where this geothermally heated water has migrated through um, the sediments of the volcano and has um, blasted out into uh, the ice surface as a vapor. And so I think these are great analogs where we can learn about how to better look, right? I always think we have to be able to do it on Earth if we're going to be able to do it um, in the really challenging environment of Europa. Right. Get it right here before you launch the thing into space. Yeah. <laughs> well, I think it's time to to open up um, uh, questions to the audience. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to hand over to uh, Rebecca McDonald, our director of communications, and uh, Frank Machis, who's the senior planetary astronomer at the SETI Institute, and uh, they are going to um, alternately bombard you with questions that have come in from from the audience. So over to you, Frank. No, I'm, I'm sorry. Uh, thank you. So we had more than 100 questions. So we are not going to be able to answer to all of them, but I, we have already very interesting questions and most of them have been answered so far. We get one question from Alex Story, uh, who's asking about the biosignature that might be detected from orbit, assuming plumes either exist or do not exist. And if the if to talk about the difficulty of taking samples to analyze them. Uh, Jill, do you want to take that? Um, sorry, I was, uh, so that was the difficulty of collecting samples from the plumes? Correct. Um, so I, yeah, uh, that's kind of a combo question, I think, for Cynthia and I. Um, you know, on Earth, it's very different. Um, we can set up a time-lapse camera and try to sneak up on some of the uh, brines leaking out of a place in Antarctica, like Blood Falls, and then I can walk up and collect a sample, or we can try to drill into it and collect it. But on a place like Europa, um, you would need some type of um, capture mechanism. So you would need something that could um, orbit the planet. And Cynthia already talked about some of the challenges with the radiation. And then you'd need some kind of net, right? And I know there's uh, different types of gels and things like that, but you'd have to be able to collect that sample um, so that you could analyze it. Yeah, and so on uh, the Europa Clipper spacecraft, we have two different instruments. We have a dust detector called SUDA, and then we have a mass spectrometer called Mass Specs. And so the two of them together will be able to look at gases that are ejected from the surface as well as dust particles. Um, they're not going to have something like a, so, so they'll be able to look at the composition of material. Um, however, this material is moving very quickly when it's ejected from the surface, and the spacecraft is also moving very quickly quickly. Um, and so we're not going to, it's not going to be like um, the, the Stardust mission or some of these missions where we've actually flown an aerogel to capture particles in this very soft bed of really, really low density material to bring back to analyze in a terrestrial lab. We're not going to do that on Europa Clipper. Instead, we're going to catch the particles and basically break them down um, to figure out what their sort of fundamental chemical composition is. So we're not going to be able to bring like a micro scope to look for little tiny microbes or anything like that. Um, so it's going to be a much cruder kind of analysis, but we should be able to get sort of the bulk chemical composition of the material that's thrown off the surface. Um, and that'll be a great starting point in, in understanding what sorts of materials um, 
could be ejected in these plumes if we see them. Um, and if there are no plumes, again, we can still measure the composition of the surface a bit by, by seeing the material that's just ejected from the surface. It's at much lower concentrations than if there was a plume, but we'll still be able to detect it and measure it. Great, thank you. Uh, Rebecca? Hi, this question is from Andrew. Have the Russians found any life forms in Lake Vostok and how does their work complement Jill's work? Um, great question. Uh, so unfortunately, there was no clear evidence because of the way that Lake Vostok was drilled into. Um, there, it's, a, it's, it's the deepest lake, it's the largest lake that we know of in Antarctica. It's about the size of Lake Ontario. And the drill that was used, there was when you're, when you have liquid under pressure and you penetrate into it through ice cover, you're going to have this upwelling of the liquid into the borehole. And so it rapidly mixed with the drilling fluid and it was really difficult to distinguish life from non-life in the actual sample of Lake Vostok that was collected. However, there's been a lot of work on the ice cover itself, right? And so that's why I'm interested in variations in ice cover, because part of that lake water from Lake Vostok actually freezes onto the bottom of the ice and makes part of that um, ice that you can collect as a core. And you can look at that and start to think about what some of the chemical constituents and microbial cells might be like in um, that ice cover. Does the Russian work inform our work at, on subglacial lake wellness? Absolutely. Um, the, one of the wonderful things about Antarctic work is that it's um, highly collaborative and it's an international community. This is really, these are really hard, complex problems. And so um, we meet together and talk about some of the challenges that we face and some of the protocols that we use. So um, I think Vostok work um, has really excited the community to look for other lakes and potentially lakes under thinner parts of the ice cover, which is what we did when we went to Lake Willens. It was only 800 meters of ice um, as opposed to four kilometers. So yeah, that's, it's, an, it's an awesome question. And there's still so many lakes to explore. So um, yeah, we need to band together to do it. Okay, well, we're gonna stay in the topic of uh, Antarctica with a question from John B. Uh, that's for you, Jill. How specialized are the microbes you have found in subsurface lakes in Antarctica? Are they found elsewhere on Earth? Could we expect the same pattern on Europa? That is an awesome question as well. And so um, I showed that picture of a microbial genome on um, my slide. And so there's a lot of information in that, um, that, those molecules, right? It can tell you a lot about the microbes. So when you look at their family tree and who they're related to, many of these um, subglacial lake microbes are related to other subsurface microbes that um, from places that we've explored on our planet, right? Whether the deep subsurface or whether marine sediments uh, around the globe. And so there is some heritage there in terms of relation, but in terms of specialized function, that's what's in that genome. And some of it, we don't even know what it does, like what some of the, um, the genes are for, but microbes in subglacial environments do have unique adaptations for living in the cold, for living in the absence of sunlight, and for taking advantage of the food buffet that is there for them, which is um, these crunched up rocks below the glacier. Um, so, okay, so that was the first part of the question. And then the second part, um, so yes, there's some commonalities and some differences when it comes to subglacial microbes. In terms of what we expect on Europa, I mean, you got to keep an open mind. It could be really, really different. Um, but some people also think there could be a universal nature to biochemistry, just given the elements that are available in the universe for life to take advantage of on a rocky body um, with water and ice. And so I would expect that any life form on Europa would have to have strategies to deal with the cold, to deal with the darkness, to potentially deal with salt, and to be able to harness its energy from rocks. Great, thank you very much. I think this next question is for Cynthia. Uh, it's from Michael. We've spoken about life on Europa, but this may be simple microscopic life. What is the likelihood of intelligent life and what parameters would, ha would have a correlation to the discovery of intelligent life? That's a, that's a great question. Um, 
I think that all of us would love to find intelligent life or even, you know, multicellular life. Like, you know, I'd take fish on Europa. That would just be amazing and mind blowing. But unfortunately, it's really, really unlikely. Um, and the reason for that is just energy. Um, you know, we talked about how life has certain requirements. It needs certain, certain parameters to survive. And while we think that life could exist on Europe, but we're talking about very simple, you know, single cell life, maybe multicellular, but no complex organisms. Um, some, some folks have done, basically they've looked at the amount of energy, sort of energy and energy density um, that we think would be available um, in Europa's subsurface ocean. And there's just not enough. Um, so, we think that the chances of intelligent life on Europa are, I would say, vanishingly small. Of course, you know, there's, there's always life as we don't know it. Um, so I'm not going to rule out the possibility of something, you know, that we've just never seen, that we just can't even conceive of, that maybe we wouldn't even recognize as life. Um, I think that's a possibility. Um, but I think that finding, you know, whales or giant squid or, you know, mermaids or anything like that in Europa, unfortunately, vanishingly small. And I would just add, if I could, um, you know, the information storage molecules that life on Europa might be using could hold potentially a lot of information. So even though we say just a microbial cell, there's still like on average, what, five to six megabase pairs of DNA in there that can store information and could be used in ways that we don't fully understand. Yeah, that's absolutely true. Um, probably they're not gonna be building radio telescopes to, to call back to us on earth and say hi, but yeah, it would still be fascinating and amazing to find life there, even if it is, you know, just single celled life. Mm -hmm. Okay, so we have a lot of questions about radiation. So I'm trying to combine them. Those are, this, those are questions coming from Vaishnash, Ron, and Akshvat. So one, what, first a question for you, Cynthia. Um, where, what, are the, what is the origin of those radiation? Where are they coming from? From Jupiter, from Europa, some, some other phenomena? And then why are they so were they much higher near Europa than in orbit around Jupiter? And then there is a question for you, Jill, is would this radiation have an effect on the type of life you expect on Europa, considering the kind of mutation uh, the, this microbiological life will, find, will, will suffer? And uh, do we see the same kind of phenomena on Earth? Mm. Okay, so starting on the on the radiation question, yeah, so Jupiter, it's a giant planet and has a giant magnetic field. Um, and so basically what happens is that when charged particles just from, you know, the solar wind um, that are just kind of in the interplanetary space heading out to Jupiter, when they start interacting with Jupiter's magnetic field, um, they get accelerated. And so it's these accelerated charged particles that, that produce the really high energy radiation that we experience at Europa's surface. Um, and so it's a variety of, you know, there's, there's different, there, there's, there's different kinds of, you know, there's, there's high speed electrons and there's ions and there's, you know, all sorts of things that the, the folks who like to do magnetohydrodynamics look at and, you know, radiation studies, which is not what I do. I'm a more of a geology kind of person. Um, but yeah, but so, so that's the origin of the radiation. And so basically the closer you are to Jupiter, the higher the radiation zone that you're in. Um, and so Io is the closest in. Um, and so Io, not only does it have the most tidal heating, um, so it's the most volcanically active body in the solar system, it has huge amounts of heat, um, and it also has huge amounts of radiation. As we move out, so Europa is still kind of in the hot zone. It orbits within Jupiter's magnetic field still. Um, so you really have to get out further to Ganymede, and even uh, so even Ganymede um, has a pretty high radiation environment at the surface, although less than Europa. And I'll pass it to Jill for the, the effects on life. Okay, yeah, so um, pretty harsh, right? Uh, but every time we say that, like, oh, this is too extreme for life, we find something that surprises us, even here on Earth, right? Oh, it's too salty, or oh, it's too cold, or oh, it's too hot. So I, I like to be really cautious in that area. In terms of what the direct radiation, radiation on the ice can do, is it can form more complex molecules, right? On an impure ice surface, when radiation hits it, it can make um, organic molecules, simple ones, but that can be potential substrate. 
So if life is in a place where it's protected from the radiation, but it's still receiving those radiation products, um, I think that's actually a potential benefit for life. Um, uh, radiation can also um, split water molecules and make hydrogen, which is another great uh, food source for microbes. And uh, like, like I said, there's always surprises. Microbes always surprise us. There's microbes in Chernobyl that um, can handle the radiation coming out of that site. And so again, no perfect analog, but that's a place that we can study to learn more about how um, maybe life takes advantage of this potential energy source that seems dangerous to us, but may be a, a great source of energy on a, on a place like Europa. Hi, I think this is a question from Eric. I think it's for Cynthia. Uh, why do we not see more missions like Spirit and Opportunity in which multiple probes are sent simultaneously? R&D seems to be the major expense in these missions and with the sheer time it takes for these probes to travel, it feels like making progress and exploring Europa would take multiple decades instead of multiple years. Um, I would love to see multiple probes being sent to different places. Um, I think that that's a, that's a fabulous plan. It's worked out well. You know, we had two voyagers, we had multiple pioneers, we had spirit and opportunity. Unfortunately, it comes down to dollars, even though, you know, the dollars per science is probably less if you build two of something as opposed to building one, still the total amount of dollars that it takes to, to build two of it is a lot of money. Um, and so unfortunately, missions that go all the way to the outer solar system in particular, they're expensive. Um, it's a long trip out there. You need a lot of radiation shielding, a lot of propellant. Um, Europa Clipper is going to have, you know, solar panels that are the size of a basketball court. I mean, it's a difficult place to send missions. And so while I certainly would love if we had two of them, or maybe we have one that goes around Jupiter, and then one that we send out to Saturn or something, I mean, that would be amazing, but it comes down to money. Okay, thank you, Cynthia. Um, so we have some interesting questions here. One of them that I never thought about uh, from Andrew, who is asking if it's conserv conservable that microbiological life from Earth seeded Europa at some point and vice versa, via meteorites. Is that this seems to have happened between Earth and Mars, will it have, will it have happened also between Europa and Earth? Actually, um, I can take that one if you don't mind, Jill. Um, so, so yeah, so that's actually one of the most exciting things, in my opinion, about the possibility for life on Earth. And that's that, yeah, we know we found meteorites on the surface of Mars, and we've also found meteorites on the surface of the Earth that we can prove came from Mars, that they match the composition of Mars perfectly. Um, so we know sometimes we say that, you know, Mars and the Earth have been swapping spit, right? They've been sending rocks back and forth. Life could have started on Mars and then seeded the Earth or vice versa. You know, we could all be Martians. Um, but the thing is that if you look at the dynamics, while it's possible to get rocks back and forth from Mars to the Earth, from Earth to Mars, um, you can't do it to Europa. So even if we managed to somehow eject a rock off of the Earth and it made it out toward the Jupiter system, Jupiter is so big, its gravity well is so big that it's going to hit Jupiter. It's basically vanishingly impossible to send a rock or a chunk of ice from Europa to the Earth or from Earth to Europa. And that's actually a really profound comment because what that means is that if we find life on Mars, right, I'm not going to complain. I think that would be amazing. It would be awesome. But it's not going to be proof of a second origin of life in our solar system. If we find life on Europa, even if it is just those, you know, those fabulous little microbes, that is origin of life number two, the second genesis of life. And if we can have life that starts not just once, but twice in our dinky little solar system, then you look up at the sky and you look at all of those stars that now we know the vast majority of them have planetary systems surrounding them. So all of those stars, all of those worlds, all of those solar systems, if life can start twice in our little unremarkable solar system, you look up at the sky and life is abundant. Life becomes, it goes from being a rare special phenomenon to something that's got to be ubiquitous. And that to me is one of those paradigm shifting civilization scale concepts. 
And that's why I've devoted my scientific career to studying Europa. Um, here is a question from David. Any idea what causes the color in the surface stripes of Europa? Usually when I see red like that, I expect organic compounds. So when we, when we look at the surface of Europa, most of the, so, so one data point first is that most of the pictures you see of Europa are highly color enhanced. They've been, they've been stretched and modified so that we can really see the color differences. Um, Europa's surface is mostly bright kind of white. And then there's some places that are kind of a reddish, brownish, yellowish sort of non-white material. Um, I once called that the non-ice contaminants. And Frank Drake actually came up to me after a talk and said, no, don't call them contaminants because that's the good stuff. So I always remember that and I make sure I call them, you know, constituents or components, right? Because yeah, we don't want to, we don't want to be, you know, Frank Drake is a really smart guy, right? So you don't want to be dismissive of anything he says, but he was absolutely right. That's the good stuff. That's the non-ice materials. Um, and so we know from spectroscopy that that material, it contains some kind of either highly hydrated salts or, you know, so it could be things like magnesium sulfates or sulfuric acid. Um, there's a bunch of kind of compounds in that same category um, that seem to match the spectral features that we have so far. Um, we haven't seen any signs of organics yet. Um, the Europa Clipper spacecraft will have a, a very good um, high resolution um, mapping infrared spectrometer called MISE, and the MISE instrument will be able to determine the composition um, using spectroscopy uh, much better than we've been able to do so far. So we'll get more information on that. Great. Uh, we're, we're running short on time, so there's going to be one more question from Frank, but I don't want to pose another, you know, this is, there's no money on this, but, but the next question that's going to come up on your screen is uh, Mars or Europa? Where will we find life first? Um, and we'll see what happens there. Okay, Frank, the last question from the audience. I'm very disappointed I cannot vote for this one. But that's okay. <laughs> <laughs> so I have a, a question from Leonardo, Leonardo Pierre that I combined with another question too. Uh, is there a concern of contaminating potential subsurface, subsurface life if we drill on Europa's surface? And did we learn anything uh, while drilling uh, Antarctica lakes to avoid this kind of contamination? So it's a question for both of you. Yeah, you want me to start, Cynthia? Yeah, why don't you start? I think about that all the time. I'm always worried about contamination. And so um, we take it very seriously in Antarctica and it's really hard not to bring something from the surface into these subsurface lakes. And so the best um, prevention, I mean, we clean um, using some of the specs developed by NASA for their clean rooms, the rigorous way that they clean their instruments. Um, we do that even for the instruments that we use in Antarctica. But I also am very careful to take an inventory of any of the microbes that may be on the instruments that I use to collect samples. And that way I know what may potentially be on the surface, right? And so um, knowing what may be a contaminant, I think is really important. I think once a human um, gets involved, I call it trying to be mindful, but it's, we are just covered with microbes. There's orders of magnitude more microbial cells than uh, human cells. And so I think it's a, it's a real challenge. Um, and maybe Cynthia can touch upon how maybe the journey to Europa and the time on the surface might uh, help with that a little. Yeah, and so when you're talking about going to Europa, one of the advantages, well, you have a couple advantages. One is you're not bringing any of those pesky humans along with you. So, you know, you, you build your spacecraft. Um, this is less of a concern for the Europa Clipper spacecraft, although there are, so NASA has what's called planetary protection requirements that make sure that we don't contaminate other places in the act of studying them. And so the orbiter will, the Europa Clipper orbiter will need to meet pretty strict planetary protection requirements, but where it really comes into play is with a mission like the proposed Europa lander that would actually land on the surface. Um, and so there we need to be extremely careful um, not to contaminate the surface, um, not to bring anything with us. And fortunately, so we're not gonna land humans on the surface, so that's good. Um, they're not gonna be breathing all over our nice pristine location. Um, the radiation um, en route, so while we're traveling from the Earth all the way out to Jupiter, there's plenty 
plenty of radiation that will help to sterilize kind of the outside of a lot of our of a lot of our spacecraft. Um, and then yeah, we do the 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 same things that Jill was talking about, where we try to very carefully sterilize everything on the inside as well as we can, and we also take a very careful inventory of everything we're bringing with us. So yeah, the last thing we want to do is to go there, discover life, and then oops, nope, sorry, that was just a hitchhiker from Earth. Someone sneezed on the spacecraft. Um, we do the same thing for the Mars rovers um, as well. So so the new um, Mars 2020, the Perseverance rover, um, goes through very, very careful um, cleaning for planetary protection. And we would do the same thing for a mission to Europa's surface as well. Wonderful. Well, thank you very much for all of those amazing questions. Uh, that was, was really, really good. The, the, the polar results are in, and I think Mars just about comes, comes ahead. Um, 183 votes to 116. So, so it's up to you to actually prove it. <laughs> Um, and before I hand back to Bill, just, just one um, uh, wrap-up question for both of you. Uh, thank you very much for, for all this amazing stuff. I, I, I've learned so much. I'm not a planetary astronomer, so this, this is all very exciting to me. Um, so if you had a, a wish list for the next mission or the next experiment, doesn't have to be, you know, off planet. Um, and, you know, we don't have to worry about contamination issues. Cynthia, what would you like, what would you uh, like to build? I want to land on Europa's surface. Um, and, you know, that's probably not going to surprise anyone, but it's not so much for the biology, right? I mean, you know, the biology and the chemistry and, you know, all of the stuff we can do from the surface will be amazing. But I'm, a, I'm an image processing person. And so what I want, I want that picture from the surface. I want to actually see what it would be like to sit or stand on the surface of Europa and look out and see that ice covered horizon, see Jupiter in the sky above you. It's just going to be amazing. I can't wait to get that picture. So that's what I'm in it for, to be truly honest. Jill, uh, no budget restrictions on this. What would uh, you like? I mean, I want to sit. I want to see that picture too. I think that sounds amazing. Um, ice is a, a fabulous ecosystem. It doesn't seem like that at first, but there's really all sorts of nooks and crannies. And so, if I had an endless budget, I'd want to um, create a large walk-in uh, Europa cooler where I could set up all different types of experiments, long-term experiments that, like, future generations could actually look at these microbes to see what true growth rate might be like in a in a really cold system. Um, and I, I just wanted to touch on Cynthia's uh, statement about this uh, second origin of life. I think that if it happens on Europa, it's going to be really different. The conditions are really different than even what early Earth was like. And so I just think there's, there's so much potential to learn there. Great. Thank you so much, both of you. Um, and to wrap up the evening, and thank you, everybody else, for, for tuning in. Um, this will be available on YouTube, I believe, and, and Facebook as well. Uh, it's streaming. So um, I'm going to hand back over to Bill to wrap things up. All right. Well, thank you, Simon. And thank you, Cynthia. And thank you, Jill. This was absolutely awesome. And it was just fantastic to see the range of, of a question, some incredibly insightful and wonderful questions coming in from the audience. But, but for, to both of you, it's like, you know, I'm sorry, but I've already fulfilled your wish. I mean, here I am on the surface of Europa. You can see <laughs> Jupiter over my shoulder there. You can see the sun in the distance. You can see the icy surface I'm standing on. And I've got my radiation shield up to prevent me from getting cooked like a fried chicken. But uh, no, it You're taking would, social distancing a bit too far, Bill. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. But uh, I will say, uh, Cynthia, I don't know if, if this is something you can get your hands on that we could at some point share with our audience, but I was at a NASA uh, autonomy workshop uh, a year and a half ago, and, and one of your colleagues from JPL was sharing this animated video of a future um, Europa mission in which a lander lands on the surface and deploys a drill basically that's uh, you know on a cable tether that drills all the way through the ice and then deploys another little crawler that crawls underneath the uh, the the uh, subsurface uh, layer of ice and also has instrumentation to you know detect biology and the the animation is, is absolutely stunning and mind-blowing so um th that's very cool if you ever get a chance to see it but um i also just like jill uh, cynthia i want to comment on your 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 notion about a a second you know unique biogenesis i mean that that would be indeed extraordinary and you know when you're in the business of searching for life in the universe and in your own backyard you find two unique and distinct 
um, uh, Genesis events, it does pretty much say, you know, game over as far as life in the universe is concerned. And, uh, you know, long before I, I joined the SETI Institute and had the privilege of working with people like you, I, I commented years ago, I said, you know, I think what we will find, uh, and this is even before the Kepler mission, is that one of the most remarkable things about life may be that it's not remarkable after all. That, that life as, as a phenomena is, is present throughout the universe. And, uh, you know, I, I think explorers in the future will, will bear me out on this, but this was absolutely brilliant. Thank you both so much. Thank you everybody for joining us tonight. We had at the peak over 450 folks joining us on Zoom and another hundred or so on, on our Facebook um, channel. As Simon did note, uh, this will be available to everybody um, on our Facebook, uh, sorry, uh, well, on Facebook, yes, and also on our uh, SETI uh, YouTube channel. So you'll be able to see this anytime and share that link with your friends. So please do that. This is absolutely brilliant. And um, we'll see you again next month for another virtual SETI talk. And we'll be sharing information about that talk uh, upcoming and uh, hope to see many of you back for that or even more. Some of the poll results uh, as well, um, you know, 40% of you said that you have uh, seen uh, and, and participated in SETI talks before. 19% uh, said you, you, you'd done it before, but only uh, online and 42% of you said this was your first time. Somehow that doesn't add up to 100%, but you know, it's the new math that is available on Zoom. Um, and the question about whether or not you think there is life on Europa, um, 37% said yes, only 4% said no, and a sort of conservative 59% said I don't know, which is fair enough, but, uh, but I'm, I'm kind of in the yes camp myself, along with our speakers, I think. Um, so again, thank you all very much for joining us tonight. Thank you again, Jill and Cynthia and Simon for your moderation, for Frank and Rebecca, uh, to Lee and Jasmine and the team back at the Institute for putting all the technology together to make this happen. Uh, everybody stay safe. Have a great rest of the week. Don't forget to say hi happy birthday to, to uh, Frank Drake. And we'll see you next time at the SETI Institute SETI Talk Series. Thanks again.